Meditation is not about whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. It's about how aware we are, how mindful we are. Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. The why and the how of practice. Why do people do meditation practice? Why in the busyness of our lives and in the midst of a very fast-paced culture, why do we come and take time to be on a silent retreat? Each of us may start with a variety of different motivations. We may have come here for quite different reasons. For some people, maybe it's to reduce stress in your lives. You know, just to ease the pressures or cool out from the pressures of one's life. You know, and in our culture in general, meditation as stress reduction, stress reduction has gotten quite popular. Maybe people come to practice because of wanting to understand a little bit more about the nature of the mind or about the nature of suffering, either emotional or psychological, and a way of understanding a way of coming out of that, relieving it. We might be inspired by the possibility of a radical transformation of understanding who we are, really coming to the deepest understanding of what life and death are all about. And in the Buddhist context, this radical transformation of understanding is called enlightenment or awakening or the highest peace. Now, for many of us, we may come with an initial motivation, but very often as our practice deepens, our very motivation may change because as our practice deepens and our understanding grows, we begin to open up to new possibilities, to see the possibility of things that we had not considered before. But for all of us, regardless of what our initial motivation may be, we all start really in the same place. We start this journey, the spiritual journey, whatever our motivation, with the very simple steps of calming the mind and collecting the attention. And we give the mind an object like the breath, or like a sound, or the body, or movement. And we simply practice coming back to that object of awareness, the object of meditation, again and again and again. Now this practice of coming back to the object is very simple. So it's not complicated. It's not as if we have to visualize some complex you know, image in our minds is just one breath or one step or a sound. So it's very simple. But as you have probably noticed during the day, at different times during the day, it's definitely not always easy. Why isn't it easy? Something so simple. Because I'm sure you've seen during the day how often our minds simply are running wild. 
You know, we can feel thoughts and judgments in the mind as these very loud, demanding voices calling our attention. We may be lost in a steady flow of different images in the mind or lost in fantasies. There's the roller coaster of our emotions. How many different emotions did you have today? You know, you were interested or bored or happy or sad or a whole range of different feelings. We often get carried away by them. We're carried away by the endless number of thoughts of past and future. It's amazing how our mind creates the reality of past and future for us in the different thoughts that are arising so many times a day, countless times. It's as if we hop on these trains of association in our minds. You know, a thought arises and then there's a whole train of association. And we don't know when we've hopped on this train. We're usually not aware of it. And for the most part, we have no idea where the train is going. You know, and then sometime it might be some seconds or a minute or several minutes or ten minutes later. It's as if we wake up, we get off the train. Oh yeah, the breath, a sound, the body. We're back again. When people start looking inward and paying attention to their minds, it's as if we have gone to a movie theater where they're changing the film every three minutes. You know, would you pay seven bucks to go to... (laughs) Probably not. But this is very much the reality that we're living in. Now, often we call this the wandering mind. But I think that's not such a helpful phrase. Because our mind actually doesn't go any place. It's not that our mind wanders. Rather, it's different objects that are arising in the mind. There might be thoughts or images or emotions. Different objects are arising in the mind and we're simply not aware of them. We're simply not mindful. So the first insight of insight meditation, the name of this practice in, in the Pali language is called Vipassana, and it literally means seeing things clearly, or seeing clearly. But it's often translated as insight meditation. The first insight of insight meditation is understanding how often we get lost in the stories, the content of our mind. Has anybody not seen that today? It's like even after one day of practice, this becomes so obvious to us. How often we're not aware of what's arising. Don't underestimate the importance of this insight because most people do not know this about themselves. If you went up to just anybody on the street and asked them, does your mind wander? Do you get lost? No, 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 I know what's going on. Because unless we've actually looked, unless we've actually turned our attention to look at our minds, we don't know this. And when we don't know this about our minds, then we're not generally motivated to practice awakening, to practice being aware, to practice being mindful. So this first insight about the nature of the mind and how it gets lost in what's arising is a very important one. There's a Native American writer. Her name is Louise Erdrich. And she's, she's a beautiful writer. And I came across just these few lines where she described uh, described the power of awareness. She wrote, 
those powerful moments of true knowledge which we paper over with daily life. But every so often something shatters like ice and we fall into the river of our own existence. We are aware. I just find that such a beautiful expression. We fall into the river of our own existence. We are aware. We actually become mindful in moments of what it is that's arising in our experience. So we practice being mindful, being aware, coming back to the breath, to a step, to a sound, to a feeling in the body. And slowly, through this practice, the mind begins to settle down. The thoughts are still there, but they're softer. They're not quite so demanding of our attention. And we begin to experience moments of real clarity and stillness. In this clarity and stillness, something else begins to happen. And you've probably had this experience as well today. That is, as we become even a little bit more present to our experience, our minds are somewhat less distracted, and we begin to feel our bodies in a much more intimate and direct way. We might begin to feel places of tightness, of tension, of pressure, maybe places of discomfort that we didn't even know were there until we turned our attention inward. Now it takes some courage to be willing to explore the nature of the body. Because in part, it means exploring the nature of discomfort. It means, in part, exploring the nature of painful feelings. But this is an important part of our path. Because one of the things we begin to see is that how we're relating to our bodies in its totality, both the pleasant and the unpleasant, we begin to see that how we're relating to our bodies reveals a lot about how we're relating to life. Because our experience is in life, sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. How do we relate to those experiences? Now, we'd all like for our lives to be always pleasant, for the body never to get sick for the mind to only have pleasant mind states. But is there anyone here for whom that's true? It's not how life is, as we all know. So we can begin to bring some wisdom into this play of pleasantness and unpleasantness. We begin to investigate it with wisdom, so we come to an understanding. We come to a better relationship with it. So, for example, with unpleasant sensations, discomfort, pain in the body, what is that about? What is the pain about? We can look and we can really see for ourselves. Sometimes pain is a danger signal. You know, if we put our hand in fire and it starts to burn, we don't want to simply be saying, oh, pain, pain, hot, hot. No, wisdom says this is a danger signal. Take our hand out. So sometimes pain is telling us something, and we want to pay attention to that. In meditation, the question then arises, well, how do I know when the pain that I might be feeling in my knees and my back, when is it a danger signal, when is it not? And I've played a lot with this over the years. What I found is a general principle that I found helpful 
If I'm sitting and I'm experiencing a lot of discomfort or a lot of pain, and I'm with it and I'm just watching it and feeling the sensations, and then when I get up, you know, after a minute or so, the pain and discomfort goes away, then I know, and this has born, been borne out over the years, I know that pain was not a danger signal. It's just something that's happening in the body, and I can be with it. If, on the other hand, you're sitting and you're in a lot of discomfort, and you get up, and the discomfort and pain remains, and you sit again, and it's still there, and then you get up, and it's stronger, and over the day, it keeps getting stronger, then that's saying something. It's saying, maybe I'm stressing the body here too much. Maybe I'm straining. So if you see that that's what's happening, it would be wiser to change the position, to ease the position, not to be straining in that way. So this is using our wisdom. This is really investigating. Okay, this is one kind of discomfort, one kind of painful feeling. What's it about? Sometimes we experience pain, and what it is, is the awareness of tension that's been accumulated in the body that is unwinding. Now, we've all accumulated a lot of tension just in the course of our lives. We're carrying a lot. We hold a lot. So we come and sit. We're undistracted. We become more aware. We start to feel the tension that we're holding. Well, that's a good kind of pain. Because the awareness itself, the awareness of the tension, if we can be with it in an open way, allows for the unwinding of it, allows for the release of it. I've experienced this so often on retreat. When I can begin a retreat and it's like my shoulders are up here and just some tension. I may not have even been aware that I was holding that. And then over the first few days, I feel it, and it's uncomfortable, but it's releasing. So you want to understand this particular kind of discomfort, because with this, we want to open to it, not to move away from it. Sometimes we feel pain or discomfort because there's too much effort. You know, we're just trying too hard. We're striving too hard, and we're sitting. I'm going to be with this breath if it kills me. You know, and the whole body is getting tense and tight in our effort to be mindful. Well, that's way too much. You know, so if you feel that that's what's happening, then it's really softening and relaxing the effort. Gina spoke last night and this morning about this important balance between alertness and relaxation. So that's something to watch for during the day. Okay, so as our mind gets more collected, with the breath, with the walking, we begin to feel our bodies in a deeper way, more intimate way. Begin to recognize these different patterns of unpleasant or uncomfortable sensations. And we investigate, okay, what are they about? Then we take the practice a step further. And here's where it gets quite interesting. And that is, we can begin to investigate the attitude in our minds about the sensations that we're feeling. So it's not only recognizing the tension, the pressure, the tightness, whatever it is, But then we also begin to look, how is my mind holding this? What's my attitude towards it? And here we begin to understand some very important things about the nature of our conditioning. For many people, one of the conditioned reactions to discomfort or to unpleasant sensation, is fear. You know, we begin to feel it, and it may be okay now, but the mind starts imagining, well, it's okay now, but what is it going to feel like in half an hour? 
You know, we build up a whole story in our mind and we get afraid of what it might be like, not actually how it is in the moment. So there might be fear of discomfort. You know, we've been conditioned in that way to always avoid it because of fear. Maybe there's self-pity. I've seen this one a lot. You know, I might be sitting in a retreat and I have some pain in my back or my knees or whatever, and the mind starts thinking, oh, everybody else is in bliss and I'm the only one feeling pain. You know, we start to feel sorry for ourselves. It's the poor me syndrome. Or there might just be avoidance, you know, or denial. Or maybe it's just basic aversion. I hate this pain. I want it to go away. Now, with all these different attitudes, you know, whether it's fear or self-pity or avoidance or denial or just aversion, not liking, often we're so caught up in the attitudes that we don't recognize them. We don't see that that is what's going on. That's how I'm holding the pain. That's how I'm relating to it. But there's one very good feedback for understanding when we're not being aware of the attitude in our mind. And the feedback is to notice whenever you feel in in your practice or in your life, just in daily life, to really notice when there's a sense of struggle. You know, you're sitting and you start out just very open and easy and you're watching the breath or the body, but then at a certain point you become aware there's some kind of struggle going on. Now this is a fairly obvious feeling. You know, at a certain point, we do become aware of that. So what does struggle mean? Struggle in this context always signifies non-acceptance of something. There's something going on that we're not accepting. It might be an uncomfortable physical sensation. It might be an unpleasant mental state. But there's something happening in our experience that we're not accepting. Because if we were accepting it, we wouldn't be struggling. Right? So the struggle itself is this very helpful feedback. It illuminates something is going on that we're not aware of. And so what do we do at that time? We can just settle back. You know, there's a feeling of struggle. We become aware of it. We recognize it means something's happening that I'm not accepting. We don't know what it is. So we just settle back. And we ask the question of ourselves, okay, what's happening? Let go of the breath. Let go of anything you've been paying attention to. Just settle back in openness. Okay, what's going on here? What's happening? And in the openness of that question, then it usually becomes very obvious what it is that we haven't been willing to be with. And in that awareness, whether it's a physical sensation or an emotion, as soon as we're aware and acceptance, you will see that the struggle goes away. I found this very simple technique extremely helpful many times in my practice because I've struggled a lot over the years at different times. So instead of just staying lost in the struggle, really use it, because it's an invitation to look. In this openness, when we ask the question, okay, what's happening now? Then it's wisdom which understands at that time, oh, pain is like this. Pressure, tightness is like this. Fear is like this. Anger is like this. Whatever it is, we just open to it with wisdom, with understanding. Sometimes when people come to a meditation retreat, 
they may feel impatient or even discouraged when they realize that meditation is not only about blissful feelings. You know, because sometimes we have this idea, oh, I'll come up to the country and sit in quiet, and I'll just sit in bliss for five days. And then when it's not quite like that, so the mind can get a bit reactive or disappointed. But this conditioning goes very deep. This is not only for people first coming to meditation. The very common and deep conditioning we have is especially about meditation, but about other things in life as well, is that pleasant means good and unpleasant means bad. I mean, how often have we sat or have I sat? You know, and maybe somebody asks me when I get up, how was your sitting? If it was nice and light and easy, oh, great sitting. And if I was sitting there with pain, and oh, it's a terrible sitting. That's the conditioning, but it's not the truth. Because meditation is not about whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. It's about how aware we are, how mindful we are. When we become aware of the uncomfortable sensations in our body, that is actually a sign of deepening practice. Because it means we're no longer distracting ourselves. We're willing, we're open to seeing, okay, this is what's here. This is the truth of my experience. There was a very great Burmese meditation master. He was considered like a fully enlightened being. Of course, he didn't announce it, so I'm not sure how one knows, but kind of his reputation in Burma was was like that. He was, he was a very great master. His name was Shui Umin. And this is one of his very short teachings, which is so applicable to us. He said, you have to accept and watch both pleasant and unpleasant experiences. You only want pleasant experiences. You don't want even the tiniest unpleasant experience. Is this fair? (laughs) Is this the way of the Dharma? I love that one. We don't want even the tiniest bit of unpleasantness. Is this fair? (laughs) Is this the way of the Dharma? No. Because, as I mentioned last night, the Dharma means truth. It means how things are. So our path of Dharma practice is that courage and the willingness, okay, this is what's here. Sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. So we practice, and this takes practice. We practice softening, we practice relaxing, opening to the discomfort, if that's what's arising. Instead of struggling, instead of fighting with it, we're willing to be with it. So as our minds become steadier, you know, as we practice coming back to the breath, the body, to sounds, to movement in the walking, we begin to feel our bodies more completely, more fully, all the different aspects of it. And then from this grounding in the breath and the body, we're really grounded in a basic awareness and mindfulness, we're paying more attention to what's arising, we begin to see more and more clearly the many habituated patterns of conditioning in our minds. We begin to see all the many likes and dislikes, the judgments, the desires, we begin to see the inner commentary that's going on about almost everything. Have you noticed this today? Just the internal dialogue. 
Really, it's an internal monologue that just keeps rolling. You know, we begin to see all the many projections we have about other people. Often it's about people we barely know, but it doesn't stop our mind from having projections about them, and we certainly have them about people we know very well. Or there may be the endless self-judgments that are arising, you know, where we're comparing ourselves with others or comparing ourselves to some standard, inner standard that we have. It's very helpful, as with uncomfortable physical sensations, to be willing to see what our minds are doing. So it's not to stop these things, it's to simply be aware of them. And we can be aware of them in any context throughout the day, no matter what we're doing. I had a great example of this. When I was on retreat, it was a couple of years ago, just the propensity towards self-judgment sometimes over the most ridiculous things. I was on retreat at the Forest Refuge, which is kind of the other center through the woods, and my yogi job was veggie chopping. And it's a job I like a lot. I really like it when I get that job, although I'm not great in the kitchen. So I don't have any particular skill in veggie chopping, but it's kind of fun doing it. So one day, the cooks came out and they gave, there were two of us veggie chopping, they gave us a whole stack of eggplants to slice, right, for eggplant parmesan. And so I'm slicing the eggplants and the person I was, my partner in veggie, she was very skilled and her slices were perfect. (laughs) My slice, some were thin, some were thick, but I didn't think it was that important, and so I just kept slicing and you know, handed them in. And then go to sit for the morning and was waiting you know, at lunch for the eggplant parmesan. That's not what was served. They were serving something else that day. So I just kind of wondered, hmm, what happened to all the eggplants that we sliced? But I didn't give too much more thought about it. I thought, well, maybe they're saving it for tomorrow. And the next day... No eggplant parmesan. (laughs) And this went on for three or four days, and then the self-judging mind kicked in. They didn't like my slices. (laughs) It made the pan too too uneven. They just had to throw the whole thing out. I don't know, my mind just started going on and on and on. And I was really judging myself. (laughs) It turns out that they had just prepared the the trays of it, and put it in the freezer for some future time. But I had made up this whole story of what a terrible veggie chopper I was, <laughs> and they were going to never ask me to chop eggplant again. And It was all made up. But this is what our minds very often do. Now, as we watch our minds, you know, in this way, one of the things that becomes very obvious is that we don't ask for these thoughts to come. It's not like we're saying, oh yeah, self-judgment, come now. You know, or anger, irritation. No. It's just coming. All of these thoughts are coming by themselves. But right here is a crucial distinction that we need to learn about in meditation. And this, this might be one of the most important understandings to develop. And that is seeing the difference in experience between being lost in a thought and being aware that we're thinking it. It's not the thought that's the problem. No matter what it is, it can be self-judgment, it can be anything. It's not the thought that's the problem. It's the fact that we're lost in it rather than aware of it. And so a good part of our practice, and it's, it really takes practice because thoughts are very subtle. They kind of just slip right in. Very easy to miss them.
but a good part of our practice is learning to be aware of all of these different patterns of thought and feeling. Because when we're aware of a thought, something quite uh, interesting happens. Do you know the feeling you have if you go to the movies and are really absorbed in the story? It's a good film, and we're, we're caught up in the story and the emotions, and we're really involved. And you know that moment when you step out of the theater at the end of the movie, and it's almost like there's a little reality shift? And it, oh, yeah, that was just a movie. You know, it's like we wake up to the fact that it was just a movie, even though we've been very involved in it. Becoming mindful of thoughts, that moment of becoming aware is like that. It's like that moment, that reality shift, where we wake up from the movies of our minds. So this is a tremendously freeing moment, and we have endless opportunities to practice it. Now there's one, one helpful hint here. You know, we get lost in thought a lot, many, many times during the day. But when we're practicing awareness, practicing mindfulness, at some point or other we become aware that we're thinking. Maybe it's very quickly, maybe it takes some time, but at a certain point we become aware that we're thinking. In that moment of becoming aware, instead of going to self-judgment, about the mind having been lost, take delight in the moment of awareness. Because in that moment, we're actually awake. So rather than go back into delusion, into the self-judgment, every time we become aware, take delight in that, recognize that. That's a moment of wakefulness. So it's just a little shift in our usual pattern. So this is another teaching from this Burmese master, Shui Yumin. He said, don't feel disturbed by the thinking mind. You are not practicing to prevent thinking. What you are practicing is to recognize and acknowledge thinking whenever it arises. Is this clear? Because this is a really important point. So many times people come to meditation and think the idea is to stop thinking and then get into a struggle when they find that it hasn't stopped. It's not about that. It's not to stop thinking. It's to be aware of thinking whenever it arises. And so that's what we practice. As we do this, as we become more aware of the different kinds of thoughts and feelings in our minds, we begin to recognize that we are all a package of qualities. You know, some thoughts and feelings are wholesome and skillful and beneficial, and some are not. Some are unwholesome and harmful. And we're all a package of these qualities. If we can relax behind the fact that they're arising, not trying to stop them, but really practicing to be aware of them, then the mind becomes more spacious, it becomes more allowing, and we're not so driven to act or react by the habit of denial or the habit of addiction. Right? We're not busy denying, oh, I would never have a thought like that. And we say, yeah, we can have unwholesome thoughts. They're, gonna, they're going to arise. And we're not so driven by addiction to different thoughts. We can see, yeah, this is beneficial, this is not. So there's a much greater space for wisdom. We can really learn to watch and feel the whole passing show of our experience without denying anything and without drowning in it all. We really are sitting in awareness, in wakefulness. And through this wakefulness, 
One of the things that happens is we develop a greater sense of humor about ourselves. You know, we stop taking what's arising, we stop taking ourselves so seriously. And we see, yeah, these are just the different patterns of thought that come. And we can see them all with humor, with greater ease. And as we can see our own minds with a little more humor and greater ease, what happens is that we then begin to be with other people's minds with a lot more spaciousness and a lot more lightness. So all the work we're doing here on ourselves has an immediate transference to how we are with everyone around us. When we can accept our own package of qualities, it's a lot easier to accept other people's particular package. And just this ability was expressed very well in a line I love this line of poetry by W. H. Auden. He said, Love your crooked neighbor with all your crooked heart. <laughs> and to me it just captures the commonality. We're all in the same boat. You know, and we see that when we look at our own minds. That's what we learn. So from this place of acceptance of thought and awareness of it, rather than struggling with it or trying to push it away, from the place of acceptance and awareness, then we can do something very interesting. We can begin to investigate the nature of thought itself. Not the content, not what it's saying, but thought as a phenomenon. So it's as if we were holding the question, what is a thought? This is a very interesting question and one that is very rarely asked. You know, mostly we are just caught up in or even aware of the content of our thoughts, the particular story, but it's very rare that we are turning our attention What is thought as a phenomenon? And the reason it's so interesting to look directly at this is because unnoticed, we begin to see that thoughts have tremendous power. Thoughts are driving our lives for good or for harm. It's thoughts that are driving us when they're unnoticed. And when they are noticed, and this is what's so amazing, when we really look into the nature of thought, there's not much there. It's just like a, it's just like a little energy blip in the mind that's arising. If we're aware, we see that it is completely insubstantial. It loses its power to drive us. Then we make choices then we say, oh yeah, this is skillful, this is worth doing, this is not, this I'll let go of. This is a teaching from one of the great Tibetan masters of the last century. He was, he was very renowned. Uh, his name was Kensi Rinpoche. He said, thoughts that arise in the mind have no tangible reality or intrinsic existence at all. There is therefore no logical reason why thoughts should have so much power over us, nor any reason why we should be enslaved by them. Once we recognize that thoughts are empty, insubstantial, the mind will no longer have the power to deceive us. But as long as we take our deluded thoughts as real, they will continue to torment us mercilessly as they have been doing throughout countless time. I mean, he's just saying it so directly. When we're not aware of our thoughts, they torment us. When we are aware that it's just a thought, we see their empty, insubstantial nature. 
So this is a great gift of awareness. This is what we're practicing in order to see the nature of our minds, the nature of thought, more clearly. Now, as I, as I mentioned last night, none of this is a question of belief. It's not that you should believe this. It's all an invitation to look. We just look at our own minds and see for ourselves how things are happening. Now, why is this insight into the insubstantial nature of thought so important? What's the difference, lost or not lost? The reason this insight is so important, it has such consequences, is because very often in our lives we're not simply daydreaming or getting lost in reverie, lost in our thoughts, but very often we are acting them out. You know, and what's happening in so many places of suffering in the world, when we just look around and see so many places of suffering, what is it that's actually going on? People are acting out thoughts of fear, of hatred, of greed, and it's out of acting out those kinds of thoughts that all of the unskillful, unwholesome, harmful actions come. Now, the important understanding is that it's not only happening out there in the world. It's happening right here within us as well. So we need to see, we need to really look. So in meditation, we ground ourselves in the awareness of the breath, the body, begin to feel the body in a more complete way, both the pleasant and the unpleasant, and our attitudes about it. We begin to become aware of the mind, all the different patterns in the mind, different kinds of thoughts, and we look at the nature of thought itself. In meditation, we also look and open to the different emotions that come. Now, emotions are a powerful force And it's not a single thing. An emotion is a constellation of thought and feeling and sensations in the body. So we can have these powerful waves of emotion come over us. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. We need to understand. We need to really look carefully at that experience so we're not simply tossed about by these waves of emotion because they very much condition our lives. And in the meditation, we learn how to open to them, to feel them, but without drowning in them. And this is, this is a great skill. I'll just give you one example, but there are, there are many examples of a way of working with strong emotions. And we'll be talking more about this over the next days. But at one point in my practice, I was experiencing a tremendous amount of fear. And it was just like primal fear. It wasn't, it wasn't even fear about anything in particular, but I was just, it's like my whole body-mind was just filled with fear. I was, it was so bad and so primal. It's like I was afraid to go from sitting to standing. You know, it was completely irrational. It didn't, but... It was very, very strong. And so uh, this is just what was coming up. And I was working with it and trying to be mindful and noting fear, fear, fear for days. You know, this, this was what was going on. But it, felt, it just felt stuck. And then on about the third day or fourth day of being with this, I was actually just outside here. I was doing walking meditation. And something shifted in my mind. And the shift was expressed in the thought, if this fear is here for the rest of my life, it's okay. And in that moment I realized that until then, I thought I was being mindful, but I wasn't. I was noting fear, 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 but the inner voice was saying, go away, go away, go away, because it's unpleasant. It's a very unpleasant emotion. 
It was only when I got to that genuine place of acceptance, it's okay. It's okay if it's here for the rest of my life. That was the first moment that there was a genuine acceptance of the feeling. So it's okay became my mantra. You know, anything difficult, it's okay. Let me feel it. It was amazing. In that moment of genuine acceptance, that whole big knot of fear washed through. And it's not, of course, that it never came back, but my relationship to it had changed. So this is how we can learn to be with all kinds of emotions, both the pleasant and the unpleasant, just like with the physical pain. It's not pushing it away. It's not struggling. We can open to it. We can feel it. It's okay. Let me feel it. And in that openness, in that acceptance, the whole flow of experience goes on. So we explore the nature of the breath, movement, the body, thoughts, emotions. The most subtle aspect of what we'll come to in the practice is exploring the nature of consciousness itself, the nature of awareness. And this is the great mystery of our lives. You know, what is awareness? What is it that's knowing all these objects? What's knowing a sight or a sound or a sensation or an emotion? or other people. You know, what is this phenomena that we call consciousness, that we call awareness? When we look for it, when we try to find it, there's nothing to find. You can't kind of point your finger, oh, there's awareness. And yet, this knowing quality is going on in every moment throughout our lives. So as our mind gets a little more settled and focused, we actually begin in a very gentle, subtle way, we begin to open to this quality of knowing. Some, some teachers call it the innate wakefulness of the mind. I came across a, just some lines from a one teacher and I found this, this is just a great reminder. She said, trust your body, it knows how to breathe. Trust your mind, it knows how to know. So just that, trust your body, it knows how to breathe. So we don't have to be efforting to breathe. Just settle back, let the breathing happen. The body knows how to breathe. Trust your mind. It knows how to know. When we're not distracted, the knowing happens very effortlessly. So if we understand the practice in this way, then we see that what we're doing is simply coming back to awareness from being lost. It's not that we're trying to get something that we don't have. Do you see the difference? And if we think, oh, I don't have this and I have to get it, there's a lot of tension in that. If we realize the awareness, the knowing is already here, and we simply have to come back to it from being lost, then we can relax with alertness, with awareness, with mindfulness. This is kind of an overview of the meditation practice, starting with the breath, with the movement, with sounds, with the body, different sensations, with thoughts, emotions, becoming aware of awareness itself. And this whole journey, this whole spiritual journey, can be held in the understanding that we are not practicing for ourselves alone. And this becomes 
really something important to recognize. Because although our practice is individual, we're not doing this just for ourselves. We see that the more deeply we understand ourselves, the more completely we understand each other. And we can hold our practice, and in fact our entire lives, in what in Buddhism is called bodhicitta. That's a Sanskrit word. Bodhi means awakened or enlightened, wisdom, and jitta means heart, or the heart-mind. And so this phrase bodhicitta, the awakened heart, the awakened mind, refers to the aspiration that our practice and our life be for the benefit of all beings. And we can plant this seed. This is a big, this is a huge aspiration. This is not something insignificant. And so we don't want to have unrealistic, an unrealistic idealization of it. We want to start very humbly you know, and just plant a seed, reminding ourselves, yes, let my practice, let my life be for the benefit of all. And if you're inspired to, you might even say that at the beginning of every sitting or the beginning of the day, just as a reminder. It's a kind of dedication of our efforts. May my practice be for the benefit of all. So I'd like to close with a teaching again from a more ancient Tibetan master. I think 14th or 13th century, his name was Tsongkhapa. And he was uh, one of the founders of the lineage uh, of the Dalai Lama. So it's that particular lineage of teachings. And he said, the human body at peace with itself is more precious than the rarest gem. Cherish your body. It is yours this one time only. The human form is one with great difficulty. It is easy to lose. All worldly things are brief, like lightning in the sky. This life you must know as the tiny splash of a raindrop, a thing of beauty that disappears even as it comes into being. Therefore set your aspiration and make use of every day and night to achieve it. And it's just a powerful reminder of the impermanence and the essential fragility of life. And so we have this opportunity to actually do something in a conscious and mindful and awake way. You know, with this aspiration, with this motivation, may my practice, may my life be for the benefit of all.